the BBC presents Christmas Pantomime, adapted as a play for radio by H. Oldfield Box, from the story by Hugh Walpole. That Christmas of 1892, when Jeremy Cole was eight years old, was the best Christmas he had ever had. It was perhaps the last of his magical Christmases, when Santa Claus really did come down the chimney, and the weights sang, and the turkey fattened, and the bells of Polchester Cathedral rang out their joyous message by the will of God, rather than by the power of man. After that, he was to know too much, and the happy illusions of childhood were all too quickly to fade away. A very fat book could be written about all that happened that wonderful Christmas season. How Hamlet, Jeremy's beloved mongrel, caught a rat to his own immense surprise. How Uncle Samuel, with typical absent-mindedness, went to church in his bedroom slippers. And Aunt Amy went in a new hat, in which, by general consent, she looked ridiculous. How Miss Maple gave a children's party at which there was nothing to eat, so that all the children cried with disappointment, and one small boy actually bit Miss Maple. How, for two whole days, it really seemed that there would be skating on the pool, and everyone bought skates, and then, of course, the ice broke, and so on, and so on. There is no end to the dramatic incidents of that great sensational time. There was, however, one incident that then, and for many years after, stood out in Jeremy's mind away and above all the others, which roused in his breast a pleasure, a pain, and an excitement that he never forgot. It began, in fact, at the beginning of December, when he and his two sisters were out on one of their afternoon walks. They were on their way home to his father's vicarage when a large, highly coloured poster caught his eye. I say, look! Coming to Polchester! Denny's great Christmas pantomime! Dick Crittington! In the assembly room's first performance on Boxing Night. Sixteen wonderful scenes! I say, Helen, look at the pictures. Look, Mary, Dick Whittington asleep at the crossroads. That'll be on his way to London, of course. And Dick and his cat dining with the king of the Zanzibar Islands. Book now. I say, nurse, what does that mean? Reserve your seats quick so that you'll be sure of getting them. But come along, do. We're late already. But, nurse, look. Look, nothing. Do as I say this instant, Master Jeremy, or there'll be no jam for your tea. Oh, very well. I see. Fancy a pantomime coming to Polchester. Have you ever been to a pantomime, nurse? No, Master Jeremy, I haven't. And what's more, I don't want to. Lots of silly nonsense, that's what pantomimes are. But that Jeremy didn't believe. He reached home in such a state of excitement he could scarcely eat his tea. Polchester had no theatre, and Jeremy had never been to one. In some mysterious fashion, Dick Whittington himself was coming having perhaps heard that Polchester was a very jolly place. So might come any day Jack of the Beanstalk, Cinderella, Robin Hood. Jeremy, pass me that thimble, will you? What? Pass what? My thimble. T-H-I-M-B-L-E. Oh. Oh, all right. Very well, Helen. Thank you. Wake up, Jeremy. You've been sitting there dreaming ever since tea. Would you like me to read to you, Jeremy? No, thanks, Mary. Oh. It's the daisy chain and it's awfully good. Thanks very much, Mary, but I'd rather you read to yourself. Oh, very well. Shh, shh, shh. Lie still, Hamlet. You've had your walk. You're not going out again. Good dog. I wonder who the man in the red trousers was. Red trousers? What on earth are you talking about? On that poster, you know the pantomime. <gasps> Gracious, you're not still thinking about that. I want to go to that pantomime more than I've wanted anything. Well, you'll have to want. They'd never take us. Why not? Why not? In the assembly rooms, with all the riffraff of the town. Don't you remember when we were staying at Drymouth and wanted to see that Piero show? But this is a pantomime. Gosh. Turn again, Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. I know, I've got it. Look, Helen, January the 4th's your birthday, isn't it? It can be your treat for all of us. Can it indeed? It's my birthday, I'd rather you remember. 
and a silly pantomime in a place like that. If it were Drury Lane now, where Doris Gray went to last Christmas, anyway, they'd never let us. We could try, Helen. Yes, we could try. Look, there's Hamlet wagging his tail. He thinks it's a good idea, don't you, Hamlet? <coughs> Dick Whittington, Hamlet. Dick Whittington. Ah, I wish you could come with us, Hamlet. Don't be silly. It's not silly. It's all about a cat. And he'd love to see the rats and things. Rats, Hamlet. Rats, rats. Shh, shh, quiet, quiet. Quiet, Hamlet, Don. Good dog. You wouldn't bark at the pantomime, would you, Hamlet, if I held your collar and told you not to? If Aunt Amy sat next to me, would. Oh, blow Aunt Amy. Well, Helen... What do you say? Will you ask? I don't know. I'll think about it. But when Helen discovered that her friend, the aforesaid Doris Gray, was going, it needed no further consideration. When, rather fearfully, she approached her father on the subject, her request was granted with a surprising readiness. The pantomime, Helen? Well, I don't see why not. Yes, yeah, a very good idea. Oh, thank you, father. Thank you very much. The dean is taking his family, he tells me. The proceeds of the first performance are being presented to the cathedral orphanage. Very praiseworthy effort. As we'll all go, eh, Mother? Good for us. Good for us to see the little ones laugh. And so, to Jeremy's delight, it was arranged. They were all to go on the opening night. All, that is, with one exception. I say, Uncle Samuel, isn't it ripping? What? What's ripping? Why, the pantomime, of course. Oh, that. Well, I'm not going, you can take my word. I've better things to do with my time. Which, coming from Uncle Samuel, was rather surprising, seeing that Uncle Samuel never did anything anyway, except shut himself up in his studio at the vicarage and paint, curious, indecipherable paintings which no one ever bought, or wander around Polchester in that shabby old coat and hat of his, wrapped in his dreams. But Jeremy loved Uncle Samuel and knew that he understood him better than anyone else in the world. Understood children, though he always pretended to have no patience with them, far better than Jeremy's parents did. Christmas came and was over. And then it was simply a question of counting the days to Dick Whittington. The week dragged along, very difficult for everybody. Even Hamlet felt the excitement and watched from his corner in the nursery with quivering intensity. The day before the day arrived, the evening before the day, the day itself. And Jeremy awoke to the consciousness that something terrific was about to occur. Dick Whittington. He sprang from his bed and dressed hurriedly. Gosh! Tonight! Helen! Mary! Are you up? It's Dick Whittington! Master Jeremy, what a noise! I know! But don't you see... Oh, now it's fast my collar. That's not the way to speak. Say, if you please. If you please. So I should think. There you are. Have you cleaned your teeth? Yes. Yes, nurse. Really and truly? Yes. But never in all the world so obvious a lie. He'd said yes before he'd realised that he hadn't cleaned them. He wanted to take it back. He would have, but uh, something prevented him. Some stupid obstinacy beyond his control. Yes, nurse, I have. I have cleaned them. I don't believe you, but we'll soon find out. <laughs> I thought as much. Your glass isn't touched, nor is your toothbrush. So, it's a liar you've become, added on to all your other wickednesses, you wicked boy. I forgot. I, I thought I had... Oh, no, you didn't. You knew you told a lie. It was in your face, plain as a pike staff. But, but honestly... No excuse. If you think I'm going to let this pass, you're making a big mistake, which I wouldn't do not if you paid me all the gold in the kingdom. I know my duty. Your father shall hear of this. I don't care what you do. You can tell anyone you like. You're a beastly, beastly woman. That's enough, Master Jeremy. I'm not here to be called names by such as you. You'll be sorry for this before you're much older. You'll see. Now, clean your teeth at once and then come along to the nursery for your breakfast. Jeremy did so with a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. In stony silence, he took his place at the table. Hardly had he done so when the nursery door opened. It was Mr. Cole, come as was his daily habit, to see his children before he went down to his own breakfast. Good morning, children. Good morning, Helen, my dear. Well, we've all got something to look forward to today, haven't we? 
If you please, sir. Yes, nurse? Uh, please, sir, I'm sorry to have to tell you, sir, but Master Jeremy's not been at all good this morning. Oh? Well, Jeremy, what is it? I've told a lie. I said I'd clean my teeth when I hadn't, and... Well? And nurse went and looked, and then I called her a beastly woman. Is this so, nurse? Yes, sir, it is, sir. You told a lie, Jeremy? Are you sorry? Sorry I told her a lie, but I'm not sorry I called her a beastly woman. Jeremy. I'm not. She is a beastly woman. Yes, sir, you see, quite out of hand these days. I'm very distressed, very. Jeremy, you must be punished. You can't come with us to the pantomime tonight, I'm afraid. Well, did you hear me, Jeremy? Yes, father. And until you've apologised to nurse for your rudeness, neither of your sisters shall speak to you. Helen, Mary, do you understand? You're not to speak to Jeremy until he has done as I ask. Yes, father. Oh, oh, father, mayn't he come? No, Mary, I'm afraid not. Oh, oh dear. Poor Jeremy. Nurse, speak to father again and ask him to change his mind. No, Miss Mary, I won't. Master Jeremy, don't sulk. It's what you deserve. Get on with your breakfast. But Jeremy couldn't eat. He sat there, slumped over his plate, with such a look of dumb misery that it melted the woman's heart. A kind, sentimental heart in reality. There, Master Jeremy, you be a good boy all day long, and I dare say your father will take you after all, and, and we won't think no more about what you said to me in the heat of the moment. But Jeremy sat there, frozen into silence. Even when Hamlet came from his corner and snuggled against him, he didn't move. For days and days he had thought of scarcely anything else but this pantomime, till it seemed that his, his whole future depended on his seeing it. Now it seemed like a sentence of death. Wearily the day dragged by. He sat hunched over the fire, doing nothing, saying nothing. Misery, misery, misery. The eternity of his punishment hung over him like an iron chain. Oh, come, Master Jeremy. Things aren't as bad as all that. Now, you be a good boy and go and tell your father you're sorry. And if he won't let you go this time, there'll be another time, I dare say. But still no response. The evening came on, the curtains were drawn. Tea came, and still Jeremy sat there, not speaking, not raising his eyes, a condemned creature. After tea, the girls went to dress. At seven, they were taken downstairs. Doors closed, doors opened, voices echoed. Outside in the street, a carriage was heard moving away. Jeremy and Hamlet were left to themselves. No, I won't cry. I won't. I've still got you, haven't I, Hamlet? Mm. You haven't gone to Dick Whitton tonight, mm. Good dog. Mm. But we are unlucky, aren't we? There isn't another soul in the house, except Alice and Rose downstairs in the kitchen. Everyone else has gone to Dick Whittington. Everyone. Mm. That's what comes of telling a lie. You see, Hamlet, liars are bad people. Bad, bad, bad. Oh. <laughs> and then suddenly the door opened and Uncle Samuel came in. Jeremy had forgotten all about Uncle Samuel and seeing him now felt rather ashamed that his eyes were red and swollen with crying. Uncle Samuel, however, had no time to waste on such details. He was wearing his shabby overcoat and hat and was apparently in a hurry. There you are, my lad. Come on, we should be late. Late? Late for the pantomime. You're coming, aren't you? Oh, they sent me back for you. But, but I don't understand. Well, if you don't understand in half a shake, you won't see any of the show at all. Go on, wash your face. Streaks of dirt all down it as though you were a painted engine. Now stick on your overcoat and come along. Hurry! Exactly as one moves in sleep, so Jeremy now moved. Indeed, he began to wonder if he was dreaming. As quickly, without a word, he did as his uncle told him. Well, ready? Yes, Uncle Samuel. You're a strange child. You take everything so quietly. Oh, but thank God I don't understand children. Come on. Uncle? Well? There's Hamlet. I suppose he can't come too. No, he certainly can't. Oh. Well, goodbye, Hamlet. Be a good dog till I come back. Shh, shh. Lie down, down. 
Oh, I ought to go to the kitchen and tell Cook she's been left in charge of me and she'll wonder where I am. I I've told her. Don't you worry. Oh, that's all right, then. What a conscientious infant you are. <laughs> Just like your father. Anything else? No. B but is it true we're going, really? Well, of course it's true. They don't think I'm a liar anymore. They? Who? Well, father and mother and everyone. Oh, don't you think about them. You come along and enjoy yourself. I told you, didn't I, that I'd been sent back to fetch you. But I didn't know you'd even gone. You said you wouldn't go to the plant and I'm not for anything. Well, I changed my mind. Now, don't talk so much. Step out or you'll miss the beginning. Yeah, come on, we'll have to run. Here we are. A bit fast for you, wasn't it? You shouldn't be so fat. You shouldn't eat so much. Listen. Listen. It's begun already. We're not sitting with your father and mother. There's not room for you there. We're sitting in the back, upstairs in the gallery. You better be quiet or they'll turn you out. I'll be quiet. Mm, you'd better be. Here, wait there a minute. Uncle Samuel paused at a lighted hole in the wall, spoke to a lady in black silk who was sitting inside it, drinking a cup of tea. Jeremy caught the jingle of money, and then they moved forward again, stumbling in the dark up a number of stone steps. Tickets, please. First row on the right. Quiet as you can, please. <laughs> oh, oh, my great <laughs> They scrambled into their seats. Jeremy saw that on every side of him, gas was sizzling and everyone seemed to be eating oranges. Then, as he slowly recovered his breath, his gaze was drawn to the great blaze of light on the stage below, against which figures were dimly moving. <laughs> then suddenly, the whole scene shifted into focus. The oranges and the gaslight slipped out of his consciousness and Jeremy was caught into the world where he had longed to be. And a strange topsy-turvy world it was, he soon discovered, in which men were women and women men. And the shop scene at which he had been looking when he first came in turned with a sudden creaking and darkness into a garden by the sea and then into a woodland glade. Jeremy watched his eyes goggling, his hair on end. It is impossible to define exactly Jeremy's ultimate impression as the entertainment proceeded. Perhaps he had no ultimate impression. Cannot in reality have been a very good pantomime. In those years of Queen Victoria, it is not likely that a cheap touring company would have provided anything very fine. But never in all his life did Jeremy discover so complete a realization for his illusions? Whatever failures in the production there were, he himself made good. As a finale to the first half of the entertainment, there was given Dick Whittington's dream at the crossroads. He lay on the hard ground, his head upon his bundle, the cat, as large as he, watching sympathetically beside him. In the distance were the lights of London. And then, out of the half-dusk, fairies, glittering with stars and silver, danced up and down the dusty road, whilst all the bells of London rang out, Turn again, Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. Turn again, Lord Mayor of London. No, I will not be defeated. I will go on. Uncle Samuel is much better than the pictures of it that they had on the posters, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, rather lots. Oh, I've never enjoyed anything so much. I'm so glad Father let me come after all. I say, there they are down below us, look. Hmm? You can see the backs of their heads. Shall I call to them? Oh, no, 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 nonsense. They wouldn't hear you if you did. Leave them alone. All right. Here, look at Aunt Amy's hat. <laughs> I could drop an orange onto it. Wouldn't she jump? You keep quiet. Those are the more expensive seats, aren't they? Yes, yes, but never mind that. You're good enough as you are. Well, I'd rather be here. Much rather. It's 
beautifully hot here. There's a lovely smell. Ah, there is. The gas went down and the curtain went up and Dick, now in a suit of red silk with golden buttons, continued his adventures. There's no need to describe them in detail. How, receiving a telegram from the king of the Zanzibars about the plague of rats, he took ship with his cat and conquered the plague, and so on, to fortune and fame. Finally, there was a transformation scene in which roses turned to tulips and tulips into the hall of gold, down whose blazing steps marched representatives of all the nations. Come on, Jeremy. We must go. But, Uncle Samuel, it isn't over. It's close to the end. Come on. Oh, very well. Come on. Come on. Now, fast as we can. You're not too tired to hurry, are you? No, Uncle Samuel. But, Uncle Samuel, it wasn't the end. Never mind. It will be in a minute. I want to get home first. Why? Never you mind. Come on, we'll race it. There. Here we are, back home. Now, you, you nip up to the nursery and they'll never know you've been out at all. Never know? But you said they said for me. Well, that, uh, that wasn't exactly true. As a matter of fact, they don't know you were there. Oh. Well, then I've told a lie again. No, oh, nonsense. It wasn't you. It was I. And doesn't it matter you're telling lies? Oh, Lord, boy, the questions you do ask. Never mind. Let them know. I, I, I was going to tell them later, you know, after you'd gone to bed. The truth is, Jeremy, I wasn't going to let you miss that show. No, there they are. Here's their cab. We'll stay and tell them now. doing down here? Why have you got your overcoat on? I, uh, I've been to see Dick Whittington, Mother. What? You've been to the pantomime? Yes, Father. With me, Herbert. It was my fault. I told him you'd forgiven him and sent for him to come after all. He's in an awful state now that you won't forgive him. Well, I... Got... Jeremy, well, if... dear, you won't tell a lie again, will you? Oh, no. I say, Mother, when that old woman fell down the steps, wasn't it funny? <laughs> the fairies in Dick Whittington's sleep. Yes, oh, yes. Now, children, up to bed you go, all of you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Come on, Jeremy. I'm so glad you were there. I was feeling miserable all the time because I thought you weren't. Oh, but it was lovely, wasn't it, Jeremy? Oh, yes, Mary, absolutely wonderful. He undressed and got into bed, the happiest boy in the kingdom. But through his happiness, there was this puzzle. I told a lie, and look what happened. And Uncle Samuel told a lie, and no one seemed to think it mattered. It was puzzling, very. Were there good lies and bad ones? Or was it that grown-ups could tell lies and children mustn't? He tumbled into bed, half asleep already. And then the door opened and Nurse came in. Well, Jeremy, in bed already. Yes, Nurse. I'm sorry I called you a beastly woman. Oh, well, we'll let bygones be bygones, shall we? I hope you'll be a good boy now. Oh, I will be good. But, Nurse, are there some people can tell lies and others mustn't? All those that tell lies go to hell. All lies are wicked, and don't you never forget it. Good night, Master Jeremy. Good night, Nurse. All lies are wicked, are they? And Uncle Samuel will go to hell. I wonder. I don't think he deserves to go there, I must say.
in Christmas Pantomime. Adapted for broadcasting from the story by Hugh Walpole, the narrator was Godfrey Kenton. The part of Jeremy was played by Patricia Hayes, with Geoffrey Siegel as Uncle Samuel and Ella Milne as Nurse. Production was by Wynne Knowles for the BBC.